And so the distinction that uh, Sloterdijk makes in this essay basically is that uh, there is a continuity that's established through the space station between being in the world two and being in the world one, and this continuity solves the ancient uh, ontological discontinuity of above and below. Uh, but I would argue, though, that it doesn't, and um, that when you look back, now the ancients made a distinction between uh, above and below, um, that the realm of the heavens and the realm of the earth were two completely different realms with different laws altogether. The realm of the heavens was the law of eternity, or contain, was run by the law of eternity. It's the realm of the gods, uh, in the realm of absolute perfect motion. Uh, the orbits of the planets move in perfect circles, and this is what Copernicus was trying to do. He inadvertently started the scientific revolution by going back and trying to retrieve Plato's perfect orbits, and the only way he could get them to come out that way was by resituating everything around the sun instead of the earth. So while going back and retrieving this idea of perfect motion, uh, he inadvertently started the scientific revolution. But the realm of the heavens is the realm of perfection and incorruption and uh, God and his angels and the prima mobile and uh, of perpetual motion. And the realm of the earth then is fallen. The earth is the realm of corruption and generation. Everything is in a temporal mode, a flawed, broken, fallen mode. And it's a completely different set of laws. And the realm of the heavens is the realm of the gods and the realm of the earth is the realm of human beings. And human beings don't belong in the realm of the gods. They're two entirely different worlds. Now I think that um, to a certain degree um, this uh, distinction that the ancients basically had it right, in other words, in that th these sending uh, space stations and so forth into orbit actually uh, to me, when, like when I think for example of uh, what happened with the space shuttles with the Challenger and Columbia, um, it actually reinforces the ontological discontinuity, not the continuity, because when you look at those two accidents, uh, as I've written about them in a forthcoming manuscript that I have, when you look at those two accidents, what they show is <coughs> the, the, the utter fragility of these world islands that we're creating and putting out into outer space. The, the Challenger, um, when it took off, blew up. Uh, as it was leaving the Earth, it blew up. And uh, the cause of that was the failure of these little rubber O-rings to expand because NASA, NASA chose to launch uh, the space shuttle on a day that was utterly frigid and completely cold, the coldest weather that had ever been, in which a launch had ever been attempted, and so as the result of that, uh, the O-rings failed to expand to fill the gap, and the fuel leaked out and blew the thing up. And then when you look 17 years later in 2003 at what happened with the space shuttle Columbia when it crashed back into the Earth's atmosphere, what happened there was a similar single small thing that went wrong. In that case, when the shuttle took off, a two-pound piece of foam rubber broke off and was given kinetic force by the lift uh, of the thing, and it punched a hole into the gray carbon panels lining the wing of the space shuttle. And it was okay when it went up into orbit and did its mission, but when it turned around and came back into the Earth, when it, when it entered the Earth's atmosphere, all this hot air rushed into that gap and melted the aluminum thermal protection system, which then caused gas to leak out and the whole thing just blew up, basically. So there again, uh, as with the first shuttle accident, we have the occurrence of a single tiny error that brings these world island systems crashing down and shows how utterly fragile they are. And therefore, I think um, the idea that these world islands that we are creating and sending into outer space is a valid extension of the human, uh, of the macrospheres down here below where we've created, whether we're talking about apartments or whether we're talking about crystal palaces or what have you, there, it's a world uh, that Slaughterdyck has exactly right. It's a world in which um, we've got womb comfort. It's a replication of the comfortable conditions of the womb in which human beings are immunized against the impacts of chaos. Civilization is like, uh, you know, a Buckminster Fullerian te tens tensor sphere, a tensegrity that keeps chaos away and keeps the individual in a safe womb uh, that protects him. In outer space, though, the astronaut on these world islands in outer space is not in a safe environment at all. He's in an environment that is not a replication of the womb. It's a state of utter, constant peril. There's nothing safe about it at all. And so I think putting these stations into orbit is not in any way, cannot be regarded as an extension of being in the world one to a being in the world two, because this constant state of peril makes it impossible for there ever to be a, a valid human existence in outer space. It's not possible. And so all these old schemes about, uh, you know, putting into orbit uh, a, a rubber inflatable hotel 
and, and so that people can go on vacations and, and shopping and the consumer world can be simply extended into outer space is never going to happen and cannot happen because the situation, the consumer there is, is never in a situation of safety. It, he's always in a situation of peril, of continuous peril. Because any tiny little thing that goes wrong, uh, let's say the, the, you know, the thing becomes punctured by an asteroid or something, ends the experiment. Um, so uh, the ancients had it right, I think. And um, in the early, if you look back at the earliest uh, texts of the Mesopotamians where you get a lot of these myths about uh, human beings that attempt to go up to the realm of the gods in the realm of the heavens, and they attempt uh, to steal the secrets from the gods, they're constantly rebuffed and thrown back to the earth because they don't belong there in the realm of the heavens. Etana, for example, who's the first man, he builds a sort of um, mechanical eagle, or an eagle that has its wings torn off, he, he makes these copper wings for it, gets on it, and he flies up, and he falls, and then he flies up again and falls, and he continually falls, because human beings don't belong up there. In the story of Adapa, likewise, Adapa is an individual who's brought up to the the throne of Anu, the god of the pole star, and he says the wrong thing and he's sent back to Earth. Um, so there was this ancient recognition that human beings don't belong, that the ontological sphere of the heavens is, is absolutely hostile to human beings. And I think the ancients had it right in that respect. I think we look at um, you know, Plato's idea of the divorce of being from becoming, uh, he simply substitutes the Homeric gods there for the Platonic ideas, and we get this idea that Heidegger talks about as forehand and height, in which anything that exists outside the world in a theoretical mode is, he implies that it's inauthentic. Um, <clears throat> his distinction between forehand and height and zuhand and height, in which uh, anything outside the world is in a theoretical mode, I think retrieves this basic structure. It's isomorphic to the structure that the ancients had of the heavens above and the earth below, and unlike for Plato and Descartes and Newton, uh, for Heidegger, that realm of the heavens uh, is inauthentic. Human beings don't belong there, and anything outside the context of a life world uh, is in an inauthentic situation. And I think the same can be said then about this, uh, uh, the situation of these space stations that are put into orbit around the Earth. They're, they're in a situation where uh, you're in a complete state of peril. Because I think if you look back, um, if you look at another catastrophe, uh, what happened with Hurricane Katrina, the degree to which there is a great resilience of these macrospheres, these earthly world islands, is, is, is I mean, they're incredibly resilient by contrast. Uh, think about Katrina then with, you know, what happens when you, when you pop a slaughter dike in macrosphere, as happened with Katrina, when the dikes broke and uh, the, all the water poured into the city. Basically, the slaughter dike in macrosphere popped and collapsed, and you end up with Giorgio Gombin's naked life. The individual, as he calls it, in a state of Zoe, is in a role, of, is in the state of naked life, uh, where the laws of this of this polis protecting him have been withdrawn, and so he can be killed. He's in a state of exception now, and so can be killed with impunity. And that is indeed what then proceeded to happen in Hurricane Katrina, where uh, all of its the inhabitants of New Orleans were put into an immediate state of exception. And many of them can and were killed with impunity by the, by the cops who went on a, on a shooting rampage, uh, you know, hunting after looters. S however, <clears throat> the city is now back up and running. And so all kinds of things went wrong in that situation, but yet the, the, the resilience of the world island of New Orleans, and, and it is becoming a, a world island in, in an almost literal sense, uh, the resilience is, is such that the thing, you know, it, it bounces back and survives catastrophe after catastrophe. The ancients, uh, you know, if you look at Mohenjo-Daro, for example, it survived flood after flood after flood. And if, as we look at the strata of the city uh, with the Indus River constantly flooding, wiping out the city, and they rebuilt it, on each level of the strata, uh, the rebuilding is shoddier, the architecture is shoddier and shoddier, but nonetheless, it did recover time after time. And the same thing with Chadal Hoyek, which was destroyed by fire on a number of occasions, and each time it was rebuilt, but the culture was diminished. But nonetheless, the resilience of these um, world islands, these macrospheres, uh, is quite spectacular by comparison with the flimsy, uh, artificial, uh, poorly protected situations that the human being is in outside the world. It's, it's not a being in the world, too, that Slatterdijk says here. I think he's mistaken. It's a being outside the world. And once the human being is ontologically outside a world or outside the world, he's in a state of absolute, utter peril in which anything can befall him. 
uh, whether this replicates the structure of the gods or not. Does it, does, you know, with the gods looking down on the earth and this technological uh, relationship between them, it's a technologized idea of the strong observer looking down uh, over humanity is completely beside the point. And so I, I don't think there's a continuity there at all. And I, I think Sloterdijk's got it wrong. Even though I love this essay and, and thoroughly enjoyed re reading it, I think he's got it wrong. So uh, that's basically what I, I wanted to say about Sloterdijk's essay. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and leave it there then.